In this lecture, we are going to begin our section on mythology. First, we'll start with an introduction to mythology, then we'll explore Edith Hamilton's article, and then finally we will conclude with the sections we have read from the Iliad. Um, before we get into the Iliad, we will also go into more of an in-depth analysis of some of the main characters to make sure you understand who is who. But to begin with, let's start with mythology. So what is mythology? It comes from, the term comes from the Greek word mythos, which simply meant authoritative speech, story, or plot. Myth is a traditional story with collective importance, and this collective importance refers to the collective importance the story or the myth holds for a society. Myths usually began as a um, oral tradition that was handed down from one generation to another. In fact, the word traditional comes from the Latin word trado, which means to hand over. So in the traditional idea, the, tr the story is one that has been handed over from one storyteller to another without the invention of writing. Myths also hold meaning for the group and not just an individual. Myths are also anonymous. We do not know who originally created them, and they have no identified authors. Now, there are different types of myths. There are divine myths, legend, and folk tales. First, divine myths. Divine myths are stories where supernatural beings are the main characters. Usually in divine myths, that explains why the world is the way it is. And again, these feature supernatural characters, characters that are superior to human beings in power and in splendor. These could take the shape of human form or some other animalistic form. They usually have the power to control awesome forces of nature, and their own forms can be enormous and of stunning beauty or ugliness. Sometimes, though, they are little more than personified abstractions without clearly defined personalities. For example, here, the sculpture you see is the wing, winged victory of Samarath. And what it is, winged victory, or the Greek Nike, is the goddess of victory. And think of that idea. Victory is an abstraction. We know what it is, but it doesn't have a tangible form. That is an example of a character within a divine myth. Another example could be, though, is sometime um, something fully developed with a fully developed personality, such as like Zeus, who is the ruler of the gods. Divine myths, the setting, is uh, usually the events take place in a world before our own or outside the present order, where time and space often have different meanings from those familiar to human beings. Gods are often both actors in the stories and objects of venerations in a religious cult. There's a double function that leads to divine myth being confused with religion. Remember, myths are traditional stories. Religion is a belief in the course of action that follows from that belief. And again, divine myth explained why the world is the way it is. Next, we have legends. Legends are analogous to history, meaning it can be compared to human history, and usually it's done so to make things clearer, easier to understand. Legends attempt to answer the question, what happened in human past? Now our characters in legends, the central characters are human beings, but they are not ordinary people. They are heroes and heroines. Um, usually they are members of the aristocratic, aristocratic elite, and they usually have some extraordinary physical or personal qualities, such as they're stronger, more beautiful, or more courageous than ordinary people. The setting of legends is also different. Legends take place in our own world, although they take place in a time in the distant past. Usually legends contain an element of historical truth. And then some legends also serve um, a specific etiological function, meaning they talk about how the world came into an existence. Probably one of the most famous legends, and one you are probably uh, familiar with, is that of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Sadly, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, Camelot, how we know it in the legend, is not something that actually existed. Um, this story begins with a young author, Arthur, um, in the sword and the stone. 
Remember that he was squiring for a knight, the sword broke, and he had to find a replacement sword, and there was a sword sticking in a stone, and he went and pulled it out of the stone. Well, the legend was is that he who pulls the sword from the stone is the true king. Again, this and the other elements that continued are not historical fact, right? There really wasn't a King Arthur that pulled a sword from a stone, Merlin, the dragons, all of that adds to the legend, yet there are certain elements of it that we believe could have possibly existed. But in actuality, they did not. And then finally, we have folktale. Folktale is a very broad category, and because of this, it's more difficult to define. Um, folk tales include a variety of traditional stories that are usually grouped together. Easy way to think of this, it's any traditional story that is not a divine myth or a legend. For example, many of your Grimm's fairy tales, um, Aesop's fables. The central characters in your folk tales are human beings and they are ordinary men, women, and children. A folk tale tells about ordinary folks. A fable is only one category of these tales, and it has a certain meaning, um, a moralistic message to it. An example of, the, of, of this would be Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare. Um, we all know the moral is slow and steady wins the race. Now with folk tales, no one believes these are true, and that they are there for a specific purpose, either a moralistic message or for entertainment. The main characters are often um, being persecuted or victimized in some way. Um, think about being bullied by siblings. Cinderella is an example of this. And then often the ending brings about a reversal of fortune, meaning this is our happy ending. Our character who was either persecuted or victimized now comes out victorious. They often have a trickster character. Um, this is a, tri um, a character who is very smart and uses their wit to outsmart their opponent. The primary function of most folk tales, again, is to entertain, but it can play an important role in teaching and justifying customary, practice, customary patterns of behavior. Um, and then in folk tales, we tend to have different types. There are actually more than 700 different types in traditional folk tales around the globe. And an example of this is what we would call the Cinderella type. Here you have a constellation of motifs that constitute an independent story that can stand on its own. But we have some common characteristics. For example, the young woman, the younger sister, who is abused by either a stepmother um, evil stepsisters, there is a spirited helper, eventually there is marriage to a prince, and she leaves home at a young age to live happily ever after. However, this is considered a type because there are always distinctive and unusual in some way. Think of all the adaptations you know of the Cinderella tale, from the classic Disney stories to ones that have um, even the Disney live action to Cinderella stories that have been remade into other genres. Think of how different they are, yet they all have those commonalities. Another popular form of the folktale is the quest. In the quest, what happens is we have a hero who seeks a special object. Usually they have to journey to a strange land and they face a powerful antagonist. The hero usually needs the assistance of others who are most likely magical in some way. The adversary somehow captures the hero, but the hero escapes, beats, or destroys the enemy, often through trickery. The hero takes the seeked object, returns home, and is rewarded. Think of Disney's Aladdin for an example of this. And here is also an example of the hero seen as a clever trickster, whereas the adversary is usually brutish, stupid, or cruel. Another example of this would be in Homer's The Odyssey. The Odyssey tale, tells a tale of Odysseus's quest to return home after the Trojan War. And Odysseus is a normal man, but he must face many challenges to get home to Penelope, his wife, after 10 years of the Trojan War. In general, we may describe much of Greek myth as mythology strongly coded by folktale. The main characters seem like they could be real people, but remember, most of these are gods. 
and the adventures are a sort are a sort more like a folk tale. And then finally, remember when you're reviewing, trying to figure out what you're looking at, if it's divine myth, legend, or folk tale, the best way to start is to start by looking at who the characters are, the main characters, and where the setting is. Usually that can let you know what type of mythology we're looking at. Next, we're going to turn our attention to uh, the reading, uh, one of the readings I assigned for this week. And this is a small selection from Edith Hamilton's book, Mythology, Timeless Tales of Gods and Hero. Um, this was written in 1942. However, most of her writing is still relevant today. Here she explores the idea that Greek and Roman mythology is quite generally supposed to show us the way human race thought and felt for untold ages. Little distinction is usually made between the real and the unreal. Um, and not everything is beautiful in mythology. She notes that there is usually some sort of horror lurking. But something she points out in this article is that with Greek mythology, this does not give us an example into what early Greek life was like. Because for this to have survived, it, most of it had been written down um, by Homer is an example of this. Homer is the author of the Iliad, which we'll be reading in the next week or so. And what she says these myths actually show us is that we're seeing the beliefs of an already civilized class. Again, for them to have a written language, we have a high society. So they do not throw any clear light upon what early mankind was like, but they do throw an abundance of light, up, light upon what early Greek life was like. So what does this mean? Earlier societies, nomads and such, there is no record of them through the myths. The versions that we know, the ones that have survived, have been cleaned up, polished, and are, de are developed versions. Also, she talks about the Greek miracle. During this time, mankind is becoming the center of the universe. The Greeks did have the pagan system of the gods. However, by the time, Hamilton claims, by the time the myths were, began to be written down, there wasn't such a fear. And in fact, she says the miracle of Greek mythology was a humanized world, men freed from the paralyzing fear of an omnipotent unknown. Meaning men at this time did not fear the gods in the ways that they are often projected in the stories that they know these simply are stories in mythology. Um, the gods being made human made them seem much more familiar and maybe even less of a terrifying factor. It was also a way that you could know and understand the gods. You still had some fear of them, but you could also laugh at them and try to understand them. You weren't afraid that they were going to strike you down at any moment. In fact, even the most nonsensical myths take place in a world which is essentially rational and matter-of-fact. Some examples, Hercules has a home in Thebes, which is a true city. Um, people can actually go and visit the spot where Aphrodite was born of foam in Kythera. And then Pegasus, the very famous winged horse, was said to have a stable in Corneth. A familiar location or habita habitation gave reality to all of the mythical beings, according to Hamilton. The world of the Greeks was not a place of terror for the human spirit. They were not afraid of the dead. They usually saw them as the piteous dead, that they were to be pitied for not existing. We have no evil witches to be feared, and there's no astrology. And then Hamilton claims the early Greek mythologists transformed a world full of fear into a world full of beauty. And again, that's part of the Greek miracle, that we have a humanized world with men free from the paralyzing fear of an omnipotent unknown. Now, there were dark spots. For example, the gods often acted in a way that no man would, meaning very cruelly and contemptibly. An example in the Iliad, which you'll see, Hector is more noble than many of the gods. Hector is the uh, prince of Troy and a great warrior. We also do have beast-like gods. We have the satyrs, which are goat men, um, centaurs, which are half horse, half man. Um, and there are some references to human sacrifice, but they're pretty rare. 
Monsters do exist, but they're usually there to be defeated by the hero. Some example are the Gorgons, which were the females um, with hair made from snakes that when you looked at them, they would turn you into stone. Um, Medusa is an example of this. The Hydras, which were water creatures with many heads. And then Chimeras, which were a fire-breathing monster made up of many creatures. Usually they're pictured as a lion, a goat, and a snake all together. Now, Hamilton states Greek mythology is not to be read like a kind of Bible, that Greek mythology is an explanation of something in nature, how any and everything came into existence and how, how all that is, how it all happened. And she claims that at this point, it wasn't truly a religion. Myths, she says, are early science, the result of men's first trying to explain what they saw around them. And then not all of these, but some are, easy, are even just for pure entertainment. Now that is not to say there is no religion in these at all. There is some allusion to religion. And especially um, Hamilton talks about the changing role of Zeus. Zeus goes from a vengeful god to one that punishes those who does do wrong, like lie and break oath. Justice becomes Zeus's companion, and he becomes the protector of the helpless. And she claims this shows a reflection of what humans be human beings needed in a god they worshipped. And Hamilton claims that this idea of this transformed Zeus of old eventually became the universal father that was adopted by many monotheistic religions. Now, the last section of this reading, she talks about the Greek and Roman writers of mythology. While this is interesting, I will not quiz you on the dates and the titles and the plots of the specific writers, but I do want you to be aware of some of them, such as Ovid, who was a Roman poet. Homer is going to become very important because he was a Greek poet, and he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Iliad which we will be spending time on in the next couple of weeks. So please do look over some of this, um, but again, I won't quiz you on the specific names, dates, or the plays, such as Sophocles wrote, um, he was a Greek tragic poet who wrote Oedipus Rex, Oedipus Col at Colonus, and Antigone. Um, finally, in this section, I have attached a YouTube video here, which I would like you to take a look at. Now we're going to begin to shift our attention over to the Iliad. What we'll talk about first is we're going to do a general introduction. We'll talk a little bit about Homer and then the beginnings of the Trojan War. Homer, you can see I have listed here two different sets of dates. Why? Because we're really not sure exactly when he lived. He is a Greek poet, but most of his life is a mystery. He's often credited with the enduring epic tales of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, but as far as his personal life, we don't have a lot of facts. Some scholars believe Homer was one man, However, other thinks the, others think these iconic stories were created by a group of different individuals, and once they were finally written down, the character Homer was given credit for them. Next, we're going to talk about the Trojan War, because when we talk about the Iliad, the Iliad is taking place in the last year of the Trojan War. The Trojan War was a 10-year battle between the Greeks, or the Achaeans, and the Trojans, who lived in the city of Troy, also known as the city of Ilion or Ilium. What happened was the Greeks traveled to Troy to seek revenge for the abduction of Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy is the face that launched a thousand ships. However, she was originally Helen of Sparta. Uh, she was wife to the king there, King Menelaus, and Paris stole her and took her back to Troy. The Greeks or the Achaeans gathered their forces and traveled to Troy, which is in modern-day Turkey, um, to seek revenge and to get Helen back. And so how did it come about that Paris, who is also a prince of Troy, his father is King Priam, um, his mother is Hecuba, Hector, the greatest of the Trojan warriors, is, one of, is his older brother. So how is it that Paris stole Helen. Well, that's what's known as the Judgment of Paris. 
And what happens is Zeus was actually holding a banquet in celebration of the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, who were actually the parents of Achilles. However, Eris, the goddess of discord, was not invited. She wasn't invited to the celebration because it would be, was believed that she would make it unpleasant for everyone. Well, of course, she finds out she's not invited and she's angered by this. So what does she do? She makes it uncomfortable for everyone. She actually shows up at the celebration and with her she brings a golden apple. And etched upon this golden apple it says, For the fairest one. And then she just tosses it into the crowd. Well, three different goddesses claimed the apple was theirs. These were Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Hera, remember, is Zeus's wife. Aphrodite is the goddess of love and beauty. And Athena is the goddess of wisdom. So they asked Zeus to judge which of them is fairest. And he basically said, huh, -uh, I'm not getting involved in this. Because you have his wife and two, Athena is definitely his daughter. And then many uh, origin tales have Aphrodite also being his daughter. And he's basically like, I'm not getting in the middle of this, no. And what he decides is that they will actually have a mortal decide this. And he declares that Paris would be this mortal. Again, Paris is from Troy. The reason why he thought Paris would show good judgment is because uh, there was recently he had, Paris had a bull and it was bested by another bull. Well, it actually the bull was Ares in a, where he had taken on the form of a bull and won. But Paris still said, you know what? He still gets surprised. He bested my bull. Because of this, Zeus was like, well, he's a fair and honest individual, so we'll let him judge. So now it comes that Paris is to decide between Hera, Aphrodite, and Athena, who is the fairest. Well, they all, this takes place on Mount Ida, and they all each tr actually try to bribe him. Hera offered to make him the king of Europe and Asia. Athena offers him wisdom and skill in war. And Aphrodite, again, goddess of love, offers the world's most beautiful woman, who was Helen of Troy. Well, who does Paris pick? He picks Aphrodite because he wants the most beautiful woman who is actually Helen of Sparta at this time. Again, she's married to the Greek king Menelaus. So when Paris accepts Aphrodite's gifts, award the apple to her, he takes Helen away from, from Menelaus and takes her back to his homeland of Troy. Now, this not only makes the Greeks or the Achaeans very angry, of course, it's also made Hera and Athena very angry because they weren't chosen. And in the painting here, you can see this taking place. We have Paris sitting down, and he's handing Aphrodite with her son Cupid beside her. He's handing her the apple. We see Athena with her spear and her helmet, and Hera pointing to uh, the sky and the pointing to the sky and the earth, basically saying, here, I'll give you a kingdom over this. We also can tell that's Hera because she has her signature headdress on, and she is shown with a peacock, which is usually one of her symbols. So that's the story of how the Trojan War began. That Paris, when he took Helen of Sparta back to Troy, the Greeks seeking revenge followed in their ships. Here you can see on the map, Troy is located in modern Turkey, and the different city-states that we're going to see represented in the Iliad, Athens, Mycenae, Sparta, you can see them on the map of modern Greece. Now, for centuries, scholars had asked whether there really was a Trojan War. And what happened is the idea was it had been a legend. But in the late 19th century, an archaeologist named Heinrich Schleinmann declared he had discovered the remnants of Troy. The ruins that he uncovered sit a few dozen miles off the Aegean coast in northwest Turkey, a site that indeed fits the geographical description of Homer's Troy. And then one layer of the site, roughly corresponding to the point in history where the fall of Troy would have taken place, shows evidence of a massive fire and destruction that would have been consistent with the city getting sacked. 
Now, most scholars accept Schleiman's discovery city as a site of the now ancient Troy. However, many remain skeptical as to whether Homer's Trojan War actually took place or not. Now, what's interesting, though, is with this discovery, there's also no proof that it did not happen. And many scholars now admit the possibility that some truth may lie at the center of the Iliad, hidden beneath many layers of poetic embellishment. So now on to the Iliad itself. The Iliad was written about 760 to 710 BCE. It's also called the Song of Ilion or the Song of Iliam, which are another name for the city of Troy. It's an epic poem in didactic hexameter, meaning it's six feet. A foot is uh, six feet per line, and a foot is one stressed and one, one unstressed syllable. But the didactic makes it one long and then two short, uh, short syllables. Now, when you're reading yours, you're going to be like, well, ours isn't written this way. Remember, you have a translation. The Iliad is among the oldest existent works of Western literature, and it's often paired with the Odyssey, which is seen as a sequel. The Odyssey is also attributed to Homer, and again, this is Odysseus's journey home from the war. Along with the Odyssey in its written version is usually dated to around the 8th century BCE. Uh, recent statistical modeling based on the language evolution gives a date of 760 to 710 BCE. It was written in the Homeric Greek, which is a amalgam of Ionic Greek and other ion, um, um, dialects. The Iliad is set during the Trojan War. The Trojan War was actually a 10-year-long siege of the city of Troy by a coalition of the Greek states, and again it tells the battle and events during the weeks of a quarrel between King Agamemnon, who was the general or the leader of all of the combined Greek armies, and the great warrior Achilles, who was the greatest of the Greek warriors. Now, although the story only covers a few weeks in the final year of the war, the Iliad actually mentions or alludes to many of the Greek legends about the siege. We know events that happened earlier, including how the um, war began, and even those the Iliad concludes with the war still waging, we know how it's going to end. In fact, the most famous object or artifact from the Trojan War, the Trojan Horse, is actually not even in the Iliad. The tale um, ends before Odysseus' plan comes to fruition. Again, Achilles is still alive at the end of the Iliad, but we know his fate is not to survive. Now, this will conclude um, the, this part of the lecture. Please watch the attached YouTube clip. This is a short video actually talking about the warfare in the Iliad and how it would compare to the warfare of today. Next week, we will continue this lecture. I have you reading books one and two of the Iliad, but before we start a review of that, what we'll do is we'll briefly go through some of the main characters to make sure you know and understand who they are. There are many, many people in this book, and it can get hard to keep track. I definitely recommend creating some sort of chart for yourself with the Greeks or the Achaeans on one side, the Trojans on the other, and keeping the main characters um, aligned that way. But again, we will pick up with that lecture later on.